Hello and welcome to Invisible Not Broken. Today is a really special panel, which Karis and I um, were a little nervous to do, but it ended up being a lot of fun. It was sex and relationships and love and disability. So listen through to hear how mast cell activation can cause some unintentional costume play. I get to find out just how vanilla of a suburban housewife I am talking to my lovely bear co-host and how PTSD can affect a relationship. So I did want to get a little warning in here. Kiris and I both discuss some things that might be a little upsetting. We talk about sexual assault and PTSD and how that does affect sex and relationships afterwards. So fair warning, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy. Welcome to Invisible Not Broken, a very special episode. Uh, Kiris is sitting here with arms crossed looking at me like, okay, I guess we're really going to do this. <laughs> we are talking today about everything you ever wanted to know about sex and disability, but we're afraid to ask. Yeah, it's uh, uh, going to be an interesting one. <laughs> We've both been taken aside by our respective partners to find out exactly what we are going to be talking about today. And we have both agreed we will try very hard not to giggle like we're in seventh grade. We're going to try very hard to be responsible adults and that take a lasts. wild guess on how well that's going to go. <laughs> that last maybe five minutes. <laughs> All right, so we're gone. We're giggling. Okay. So the first thing we're going to get into today. The first thing we want to talk about today is uh, first dates and when do you tell someone that you have an invisible disability. You know, how do you handle that first date and saying, oh, by the way, I have this problem that may or may not get in the way of our date. Yeah, especially even before you know if it's going to be anything more than one date. Right. Or even the second date or the third date. So this can be a relationship. And there's nothing like a serious cold shower of, hey, I've got this invisible illness that will mean you might be taking care of me for... <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could be starting out with a great date and then suddenly... My shoulder pops out, and you've got to, like, take care of me. <laughs> See, I was going to go into that one, because that is thing I actually have to warn. Not that I'm dating anymore, <laughs> as boring as vanilla as you can get, married for 11 years. But that is thing I even have to tell friends when I go out, is like, hey, if I dislocate a shoulder, this is what's going to happen. Or with my pots, if I suddenly drop to the ground, you're probably going to need to just, like, get me water and salt immediately. <laughs> Which, you know, that's that's always a fun way to start out any outing. Yes. But on the, the boards that I'm a part of, some of the younger people do talk a lot about this and how when they tell someone that they have Eller stainless or they have POTS, that the person freaks out. Like, so I don't know if we actually have any answers for any of this. Uh, we're just going to talk about them. <laughs> yeah, this is just, just kind of an open forum talk about some of our experiences, some of the things we know about from other people, some of the things we've personally experienced yeah i was like for this like i had actually dated someone for two no a year or so and we lived together and i thought that was it i thought we were forever and it ended up being that i was too sick and they broke up with me because they didn't want to spend the rest of their lives taking care of someone i think i'm really lucky that this relationship i'm in now with my guys I, a lot of my problems started after I was already with them, so I haven't had to try and do <laughs> dating. That's not an issue that I've had to deal with, thankfully. <laughs> yeah, for my husband, I mean, like, he and I were best friends for three years before we ever dated. Mm -hmm. So he had already seen me through every attack, everything. He knew what he was getting into. There, <laughs> there was no backing out. He knew what those wedding vows were going to mean, and... I think that was incredibly great because I didn't have to... I was so traumatized after that person broke up with me about I being bet. sick. I was like, I don't know if I can... It's, it was just so scary. Like, how do you even touch on that again? Yeah, it, it's a rejection for something you can't change. Right, and that's actually one of the things we want to cover was this, this issue of rejection around, you know, fear of rejection and rejection by people that don't understand, that see, oh, you you have a disability, and suddenly they're like, eh, no, nope, I'm gone. <laughs> I didn't mean to laugh about that. It's just, no, it's, it's an it's, uncomfortable laugh because yeah, it really hurts. I mean, there's so many things that you can get rejected for anyway in the dating world. I mean, it's... <laughs> yeah, for real. There, there's a lot of things that people say no for that that are so much more mild than this. And then it's like, okay, now I'm going to add in all of these other issues. Yeah, I, I you know, with me, thankfully, like I said, that mine didn't start till afterwards, but... I couldn't imagine trying to date right now with my IBS and my digestive problems because I never know when I'm going to accidentally get dairy and then I'm going to have two or three days of just horrible gas and it's like, you know, you 
keep excusing yourself. They're going to think you're like, do you not like me? What? <laughs> you keep leaving the room every five minutes. Because nothing is sexier than IBS. Like, oh, that <laughs> That should go on a Tinder profile. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, with my, for a good example, yesterday, we, I had lunch, Scott and I had lunch, and he normally gets something totally different than what I do, but he ordered the same things I did. So I'm halfway through eating something, he goes, I think you got mine. And I'm like, oh, oh. It, it didn't have cheese on it, it had a sauce that had cream in it. Fuck. And I found out this morning that yes, indeed it did. And I did get here because this morning, between when I got up at noon, I went to the bathroom eight times. And there is just and nothing was, better and, than. And it was one of those, oh my God, I have to go right this moment. Can I make it in time? Kind of thing. So it's, you know, if I was on dating someone and that happened and, you know, oh, we're out on a date. Oh, by the way, I have to run to the bathroom right now. I get back. Oh, I have to run to the bathroom right now. <laughs> Someone's going to think something else is going on. <laughs> yeah. is, are you going to the bathroom and snorting something? <laughs> Do you have a drug problem and need to talk to me about it? Which might actually be an easier conversation. But actually, yes. Less embarrassing. That's ridiculous. Yeah, answer. that. that. <laughs> um, and kind of actually... T- tangenting off of the embarrassment issue, you know, if you have a disability and, you know, it does start to impact your, this new relationship, you know, are you leading me on because, oh, hey, you know, you, you acted all interested five minutes ago and now you're like, oh, I can't, I'm sorry, no, stop, please. Yeah. I mean, but even like before that, like how many dates can you go on before you tell someone that you have something that is... True. Going to be, and this is my own guilt speaking, but <laughs> and believe me, you know, Jewish, female, raised Catholic, and Jewish, I can do guilt and shame like no one else. That but explains the, a lot of my conversations with you. Thank you, yes. And the fact that I need to feed you every time you come over. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but the leading on, even from the aspect of like dating with an invisible illness, like this is something that, like for my family, this takes away resources, this takes away financial resources, time. Yeah. There are. This is this is a real commitment that my husband made that he knew, and fortunately we had been friends, so it wasn't like it got sprung on him. But it's almost like, well, how many dates do you go in and get someone to like really like you before you go? Oh, hey, this is yeah. <laughs> and depending on what it is, this could be incredibly impacting. And I don't know what the answer is to that. Like, is it a hi? I have this, this, and this, and uh, let's go out for a movie now, or like, do you wait? Like, I don't know. I, I think kind of split the difference is that. You know, maybe go on a first date, see if there's any chemistry there at all. I don't think, like, on a first date it really comes up. Yeah. But when you start going beyond first date, okay, well, this needs to really be talked about at this point. Unless it does have to come up because, you know, like... Something happens. I'm pretty obvious with my canes in my wheelchair. It's it's a little hard to go. You know, I just didn't feel like walking today or... (laughs) These heels are so pretty, but you really just can't walk in them, so I'm just going to do the chair. Like, it's... I just didn't feel like walking today. So I said, I'm I'm in a wheelchair because it's like, I didn't want to walk. Yeah. Um, So at least, like, for my stuff, it's pretty obvious. And I guess that is thing that would, you know, not that I'm dating, honey, I promise. (laughs) My husband's listening. Not dating, I swear. But, you know, like, I get lucky that my my disability can be tremendously visible. But, I mean, I guess you would have to actually explain why you can't order half of the menu. And I've had that just being out, even out with friends, where I've been, like... You know, they suggest going somewhere, and I'm looking at the menu going, there's nothing on this menu that, I, that is actually safe for me to eat. I can't eat here. And then we have to get up. This, this happened when I was at work. I've, I've mentioned in a previous uh, podcast that I was at work, and, you know, I was trying to find someplace. We went to, like, three different places trying to find someplace that was safe for me to eat. And I feel bad because I feel like I'm making them get up and leave and get up and leave and, or walk in, read the menu, and leave. And it sucks. But so maybe it's just that we are so fabulous that we're worth the effort. No, no, that expression. You, you can't do expressions on a podcast, Carol. I was trying to find a way to answer that. I wasn't making a face. I was like, how do I respond to that? Because if I say I agree with you, that makes it sound, makes it sound like I'm, you know, full of myself. If I disagree with you, then, you know. This is what happens when you're a shut-in like me where you don't get out in society anymore. You're like, I don't know. What's the social nicety anymore? <laughs> I tend to say whatever's on my brain. I have like a five-second filter. Right. But um, I want to come back around to that whole uh, aspect of trying of the perception that you're leading someone on. You know, I could very easily see with my con- current condition, if I was still dating, that you know we go out to eat, everything's great, the dinner's going great, and things are starting to get amorous, and all of a sudden, oh, my stomach went off. I something I ate at dinner actually had dairy by accident, and now you know if I'm at their house, do I use their bathroom? 
If, oh, I hadn't even thought about that. <laughs> if, you know, if we're not at their house and I have to go and I, you know, go three or four times in a row, are they getting, thinking I'm invo- avoiding them? Do I have to tell them at that point? You know, this awkward, oh, by the way, I accidentally had dairy. I'm going to be in the bathroom the rest of the evening. I think our evening is now over. Yeah. And so, and there's one thing where it's like a communicable disease or illness that, that absolutely you need to disclose before sex. Yes. But then there's, you know, things that no one can catch, but it's like, well, then the, the ethics get very different on mm-hmm. when you need to disclose that there are certain disabilities or issues involved. And also what you're saying, like, that can get awkward with, like, it's going somewhere, it's totally leading somewhere, but something suddenly happened and well, that's are off. You know, it kind of, again, tying right into that, where, say, it's a pain issue, mm-hmm. you know, and you've gotten to that point, but then, like with you, with your dislocations, oh, yeah. you know, the pain is suddenly an issue where I can't keep going because I'm in agony. Yeah. And, you know, how do you politely tell the person, <laughs> we have to stop now, I'm hurting. Yeah, and this is where I'm so fucking lucky that I'm married. And <laughs> married to the world's nicest, most incredibly sweet Preach. man on the face of the earth. Because it's not an issue in my marriage. If And this happens all the time. Sorry, honey, if I'm getting too graphic. My husband will, <laughs> will be turning every shade of red if he listens to this. But my hips dislocate with no warning that happens all the time i don't need to get graphic for anyone's imagination to get when that can happen and um my jaw can dislocate my ribs dislocate my shoulders dislocate so any position can turn into a modern art sculpture but there can be emotional fallout from that still i mean you your situation especially you've been married for 11 years it's not as much of an issue but especially if you're dating or in a new relationship that can definitely be a Oh, what do you mean? We mean we gotta stop. Yeah. Um, and for me, you know, again, getting very with having very big, you know problems with gas or having to just suddenly go to the bathroom, things are heating up, and suddenly, oh, I need to run to the bathroom right now. I'm going to leave you stranded <laughs> here while I run to the bathroom. There, there's a lot of porn on <laughs> on the computer they can watch. I thought you were going to say there's a lot of porn about that. I'm like, what? no, no, God. <laughs> No. You know, talking with you makes me realize just how vanilla of a housewife I've become. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Uh, um, where was I? I've lost my train of thought. I, uh, this oh. is going to happen quite a bit during this conversation. <laughs> we thought we were going to be able to hold, like, mature discussion about yeah, this. But, no. yeah, that's out the window. Sorry. Um, but, yeah, so, you know, do you stop and try and make sure that things complete do you say i'm sorry i'm in too much pain and deal with sometimes maybe the emotional fallout of uh you kind of left me hanging here um or you know alternatively do you find ways to adapt your sex life so that it can accommodate these new realities yes i'm a big fan of the adapt because like if you are in a long-term relationship and they already know what's going on if you hear a sudden like dislocation and the person still wants to continue, you already have a plan B. You already have protocol. I mean, I think even like outside of sex, just in general in life, the biggest problems yeah. occur because things aren't laid out. Like if expectations <laughs> aren't met, words. thank you. I actually tried for that one. <laughs> um, if expectations aren't met, that's where the biggest problems happen. Right. And so if there's like, hey, this could happen. If this does happen, then we can move on to this other Other activity activity, or you know this could work there's all sorts of body parts that can (laughs) you know you can go back to being like in high school for heavy petting stuff or you know there's other things that can happen maybe not as fun or exactly what you enjoy but there are other things and if you already have a plan of action i think that works out really well yeah i think that's kind of the, the the key to a lot of this is you know when do you start these conversations with someone when you're dating, you know, and then you, <laughs> sadly, they never end. <laughs> well, hopefully they never end. I mean, things are always. Well, I just mean, adjusting. you know, the, the conversations about how to deal with the pain, how to deal with the new reality. You know, David and I have been together for 10 years. Scott's been with us for eight. And we still have these conversations. You, you've you been together for 11 years and you talked about, you know, you guys still have oh, yeah. conversations about how to adapt to this thing and how to. Oh, yeah. It's a never-ending... Well, that's marriage, too. I mean, True. it's a never-ending conversation. <laughs> True. But I'm talking about specifically adapting to the disability. You know, and, yeah. and finding maybe new things that work, you know. They're always trying to find 
better ways of dealing with it. Well, we now have like a really interesting thing that I have um, mass cell activation. So that basically means that I can suddenly look like a Star Trek character, like, <laughs> which is, I find it hilarious. Wait, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with this. What are you talking about? Uh, so it's basically like your histamines become drama queens. Okay. And like all of a sudden it's like, hey, you're allergic to, well, let me think this. <laughs> and it's nothing you've been allergic to before. And Ooh, I will like break out into these crazy like body rashes or my favorite. And I wish I could like time it right because it'd be great for Halloween. All of my veins will <laughs> Come up, so like the veins in my chest and my face go all the way forward. So, you know, like okay, you know, talking about the whole sex stuff, like that could be some, you know, great ways to like do the costumes and things. But I it never happens when I'm thinking. Quick way to, to end things. <laughs> and he generally goes with that idea. <laughs> he panics. Yeah, kind of. I, I think it's that. funny, but I have a weird sense of humor. Yeah, we do have a weird sense of humor. <laughs> yes, I'll agree with that. Um, so, uh, another thing we wanted to talk about was what happens when you get together over commonalities, things you both really, really enjoy, and then suddenly, because of this disability, you can't do them anymore. Yeah, so, like, getting away from, like, sex and into just the relationships is, you know, traveling and hiking and... Oh, I'm sure we'll come back to sex, that's not... Oh, yeah, well, I mean... (laughs) We both have, like, the dirtiest minds ever, so we will totally get back there. But for the not dirty section of this, I will actually reference my parents because this is where we're staying the hell away from sex so I can stay out of therapy. Um, But my dad got very, very sick, and they had always hiked. That was, like, a big thing that the two Mm -hmm. of them always did was hiking and exploring new towns and... That was a huge part of their relationship. And then all of a sudden yeah. he's in he's bedridden. Like my dad can get out of bed for a little bit, but that's it. So a huge section of what they had in common went away. Wow. And that's been amazing to watch because my dad was a marriage and family child counselor. Mm-hmm. So watching like their discussions and how they've had these like the way they're able to talk about things and work through things and really change their relationship and work on it. It's been like really motivating to like keep the discussions going in my family. Mm-hmm. And just with my husband and I, when like I've gotten a lot worse in the last two years, he'd see me be sick, but no one's seen me be as sick as I've been in the last two years. And I was not expecting to get this sick this soon. And yeah. traveling was a big part of our lives. Mm-hmm. And I used to love to hike and dance and do all these things. And I worked. Yeah. And, um, it's been, a huge change, especially with my like rabid foaming at the mouth feminism. <laughs> and I have worked since I was 13. I've had my own money most of my life. I, I paid for my stuff mm-hmm. and to suddenly be a housewife at home in suburbia was not in my life plans. And yeah. it really did change the sexual politics of my family and my, not that my husband is like, I have to earn money. You will take my life. La-. Like he is so not that guy, no, no, he is not. but it is really like messed with my sense of sexuality and self and like, Oh, where do I fit in in this relationship now? Because I'm not sure if I recognize myself being this sick. Yeah, and I, I can totally relate to that because, you know, as my knee and my feet have gotten worse, I love to travel as well, and I never really had a chance to. And we had just started, like, really starting to travel, and we went a few places. And now, in the last year, my knee and my feet have gotten so much worse that, you know, taking my kid to Disneyland uh, a few weeks ago, I ended up in a wheelchair the whole time I was there because I couldn't walk. I made the mistake the second day we were there of, I'm only going to be in there until noon. I can just walk for the three hours. Optimism will kick your ass every time. Yes, and it did. <laughs> I, I, I limped the entire way back to the hotel crying the whole way. Oh. Because we weren't staying on property. We were off property, so I had to walk all the way out and across the street. And by the time I got back to the room, I just wanted to die. I was in so much pain. I took, I think I took two Vicodin and laid down. So it's another thing to talk about real quick about like sex and relationships and what changes the medication. Oh, and the fun things medication does to you. Yeah, I, I feel like it should have like they made the odds ever be in your favor <laughs> and the, like that this could kill you or and like as far as like sex goes and relationships go, the sleepiness, the exhaustion, like we're 
Well, I'm on painkillers every day. You're you're I, not. I take anti-inflammatories. Every yeah, day, but I don't take painkillers every day. I have to take um, opioid painkillers multiple times a day oh, to deal with would, the dislocations. <laughs> the side effect of that would kill me. Yeah, I, for you especially, but right, <laughs> like just to be present for my husband, to be able to listen to his day, to just get through the day, get the kids to bed, get everything going, but then to like try to have sex at night after I've taken all my pain medication and, well, and my muscle relaxers. And that's a whole other thing about the at night that that was a conversation. I'm sorry, sweetie, if I'm going too far with this, but <laughs> talking about spoons, yeah. you know, nighttime is honestly the worst time for someone with a chronic illness to have sex because you've used all your spoons all day and at the end of the day you have no spoons left over for sex so that's where i'm going to disagree with you <laughs> okay see, I, that is how it is for me but at the end of the day i've done so much and i'm notorious for way pushing past my spoon limit I, and see i think that's worth pushing past the spoon limit <laughs> well, it, it, it is but i mean except, for like a pain management because like orgasms oh, are I, like nature's painkillers true true it for me it's the the nighttime is when my IBS and stuff gets worse. Oh so, yes, yeah, that's you know, awful. Nothing's nothing's more fun than <laughs> fooling around and suddenly f- passing gas repeatedly. So not hot. <laughs> so not hot. So not any way to ventilate the room fast enough. Yeah, because <laughs> they tend to be very bad. Got it. <laughs> and so this is not a, this is not a happy sex making sexual uh, environment at that point. And it's also hard to plan for these things because you know. Oh God! Yes. When things are going to happen, as far as like dislocations or pain levels, like there's no planning, there's no knowing. But you still have to like have that closeness, and that's yeah. an issue for us. Like when I have like a lot of dislocations and we can't for a long period of time, it's it's hard not to start feeling like roommates and like like this yeah. is my caregiver and this is my roommate, and it's really hard to keep that romance going when there's yep. not that physical aspect of bonding. Yep. So I don't know. I mean, like, I don't know what the answer is to that. Like we try to do really nice things for each other. We try to send each other flirty texts and emails and (laughs) we still try to be super cute with each other, but there's nothing for me so far that I've been able to find that quite replicates that closeness. Mm -hmm. And, and kind of, again, you touched on it a little bit there, which is, you know, we wanted to talk about redefining the relationship roles because, you know, you're, one person's going to have to start doing more because the other person can't for oh, one yeah. reason or another. And the, that adds an extra strain on the relationship and an extra strain on even, you know, it, it, when they're straining the relationship, they're strain on sex because they go hand in hand like that. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're feeling like you were, you touched on a minute ago with feeling, I've always been supported. I've always supported myself. I'm suddenly now not. And the self-esteem hit you take over that when your self-esteem takes that hit, then you don't feel sexy, and it makes it harder for you to want to be sexy at times. Oh, my God. Going on that, that's <laughs> one hell of a point there because, like, I am right now wrapped up in, like, all these bandages and a really sexy medical corset. And <laughs> it, it, Hot! Well, I mean, it does, do, it does lift, you know. <laughs> The medical corset does actually lift your boobies up. I mean, there's, there's that. This is what makes me miss Ren Fair is wearing the corset and yep. like having like the entire shelving unit of my chest. And <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's not sexy to like have to have all these medical devices and to have to sleep with all the medical devices. And I mean, I live in yoga pants. I dressed up for you today by wearing jeans. Woo! Like I even brushed my hair. So we're really like going to the max here. Um, but trying to feel sexy with an invisible illness can be incredibly difficult because like for me the association I have is like if you actually see me with makeup on and my hair actually done in some sort of like decided style other than it fell this way and there's an actual (laughs) outfit that looks like it was sort of put together I did that because I felt like such utter crap that I needed to prove to myself I could still do this so that's like getting made up does not make me feel sexy it makes me feel desperate like I'm trying so hard to make someone believe that I'm still like put together and okay okay there's the word yeah okay is like pretty much shooting for the moon Mm -hmm. (laughs) so like trying to feel sexy at all with like all of these devices and things i I don't know like i I, i'm still trying to find that balance Mm -hmm. of like yeah how do you like how do i feel pretty when i'm like swollen from my medication like as a girl like i hate to say it like rabid feminist but the weight thing bugs me every time and i don't know if it's the same for you guys but well i mean we're bears so we're used to being a little bigger but yeah it's also 
you know, I'm the heaviest I've ever been in my life. Yeah. And I, I look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, why would anybody be attracted to this? And I know a lot of people face that stuff too. I'm not minimizing other people's, you know, that everybody feels that. But when you also have this invisible illness, so I'm walking around, my knee is locked because it, you know, every time I bend my knee, it wants to give out. My feet hurt and I'm hobbling through the house and I think, oh, I want to go for a walk. I want to do this. I want to do that to try and lose some of this weight. And then, you know, it's like, I can barely walk across the room. How the hell am I going to walk down the block and around the block to try and lose this weight? You know, and it, it, it gets to be, you know, depressing at that. And it, it brings all kinds of depression issues up with that too. And, you know, I talk to the guys about it, but then I feel like that's all I talk about. I'm oversaturating them with. Oh yeah. That's oh, the I'm other thing we're going to talk about is the oversaturation like of, you know, like people will say, like you're obsessed with your pain. You're obsessed with like try to think of something else. Distract yourself, and it's like, <laughs> oh my god! Like, do you realize that? Like, like I don't even say half of the stuff that's in my head. Like, oh yeah. Like I won't even tell someone I'm hurting until I'm hitting like an eight or a nine pain level. Yep, I'm the same way. I don't, I don't tend to talk about it until it's to the point where, okay, either I need to take meds or I need to like stop what I'm doing because I can't function. I no longer can function. Um, we have a cat that's sitting outside the door. Yeah, I, I've multiply flipped off my cat. <laughs> and that is not a euphemism. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so it decided to come So please start. ignore all the meowing you're hearing. I swear it's, she's well taken care of and loved, but as a true cat, this is the only time she's ever done something like this. Yeah. But, so yeah, back to our oversaturation. You know, I feel like that's all I talk about sometimes with the guys is that you know, it's like, why do I hurt this much? Why do I hurt this much? The guys have heard me. There's a running joke in my house that when my feet first are getting really, really bad, you know, it's like, what do you want for Christmas? What do you want for your birthday? A bone saw. <laughs> and I would tell them how mean they were because they wouldn't get me a bone saw to cut my feet off because they hurt so bad. Um, and, you know, it, I, make, I try to make a joke out of it because I feel like it's all I talk about is my feet hurt or my knee hurts or, you know, oh my God, why can't I just have, go to a restaurant and order what I want rather than what I can eat? Yeah, and I mean, like, I look at my life, and it's, my day is relocating my joints, taking care of the kids, the dogs, doing my my children's books, doing the illustrations, and this podcast about invisible illness, and relocating my joints again, and going to yeah. bed because I ran out of spoons at 12, or, you know, having to call my mom in to help out. Well, we were supposed to record this last Thursday, and then, we were. And then you know, I said, okay, I'm going to come over, and you're like, uh, no, I have no spoons, I'm in bed, we have to do this next Yeah, week. I think I dislocated my hip completely. Yes, it was like bad. a, yeah, really, really bad, bad day. And so, I mean, you know, that's another thing, you know, we're trying to do work, because we want to do this podcast for you guys, and, oh, hey, we can't, because uh, my hip decided it wanted to be somewhere else right now. It ran away from home and wouldn't come back. (laughs) But that's, you know, this is our lives, and it's never not on your mind. Like, there's no way to, like, put this out of your head. This affects every aspect. And then it's like, but this poor, like, partner I have who's trying to tell me about his day, and I'm like, but I can't focus on you. (laughs) And that's so not fair to him. I'm in so much pain right now. I'm. I'm, It's all taking everything I got just to sit here and smile and nod. You you actually have a smile I get, and there's, like, it's, like, super tight, and the teeth are showing, because that that means you're really smiling. And, oh, that's really great, honey. Oh, okay. (laughs) And, you know, and sex and relationships are not something you can exactly go to your doctor and talk about either. So, like, when you have, when I have, you know, I have these digestive issues. And I, I'm lucky enough that, you know, I'm a gay man and I have a gay doctor. So I have mentioned some of this to him. But, you know, it's like, how do you really just, like, oh, by the way, doctor, how do I deal with this, with this problem? Because... A, you know, there's a whole embarrassment issue of talking to <laughs> someone that you only vaguely know. Even if yeah. you have, I mean, I have a good relationship. I've, he's been my doctor for like nine years, but still, it's still really uncomfortable to talk to my doctor about my sex life. First of all, mm-hmm. but then to say, okay, well, I have this illness and these problems, and they're getting in the way, and how do I get around that? That's just not a conversation that's easy to have. No, I I was really lucky that I had a physical therapist when I first was diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos and she brought it up 
Oh, lucky I mean, you. She was the she's she looks like my like my grandmother. <laughs> so it's really uncomfortable for me, but I was really grateful that she was like, "Hey, so I don't think you've asked this question, but you should probably know some different positions to try for sex that won't be as painful. And she went through like the spoon position and like Mm -hmm. different pillows that you can use. And I was really like, even though it was a very desperately uncomfortable conversation for both of us, (laughs) because I really didn't know her that well. She was a new physical therapist and she looked like my grandma. Seriously. It was just, it was messing with my head, but it was incredibly kind of her to like push through the uncomfortable to have a conversation about something that would really affect my life and marriage. Uh, yeah. She knew I probably was never going to bring it up. And she's right. I never would have brought it up. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've only very, very mildly touched on it with my doctor with the whole IBS issue and stuff that, you know, this is, I, I think I made a reference to, this is making my life a little difficult with my sex life. And he's like, oh, yeah, I guess that would, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, was, you think? That was a whole conversation. <laughs> no, no, more, more. <laughs> More needs to be said. So I know we do have some healthcare professionals that listen to the podcast. So my friends with stethoscopes and white (laughs) coats, it is your job (laughs) to actually look at your charts and see what the person has and start... Thinking start the about conversation. To start the conversation. Exactly. I guarantee you it's a question on their minds. So. Well, and, you know, for women especially, you've got the issues of how does your birth control interact with the rest of your meds? Oh, my or God. Or if you do get pregnant, any extra complications you might have over, you know, having, especially what you have. With, oh, yeah. I'm going to have a baby, and it's going to make everything pop out of place in the process of having this baby. I will one-up you on this issue because all drugs are tested on men almost. There's very really? few drugs that are actually tested on women because our hormones change all month. So we are a very difficult. Oh. So most like the heart medications, all these medicines are tested for men. I did not know so that. the things that it can do for women are um, very different. And so going back to that hormonal issue, I can't take hormonal birth control. And I will throw. I actually would throw up until I went to seizures with with birth control because I can't handle the estrogen. It just it messes with my system horribly. So that figures. Yeah, everything had to. Yeah, the pregnancy <laughs> was a. Uh, I tell my kids they were worth it, which is very true, and it should really show them how much they mean to me because. <laughs> oh my god! Especially the littlest one, because you know by then you already knew what you were in for. I'm, well, I'd actually start to develop much um, more of the complications by the time I had Olivia. When I was younger, I was really young when I had my son, and that was difficult. But when I was pregnant with my daughter, we didn't know I had Ehlers Danlos. We just thought I had fibromyalgia. Mm. Oh wow! So um, when <laughs> you probably don't know all of this stuff, <laughs> but <laughs> when you're pregnant, you get a, a hormone in your body that makes your ligaments loosen. Oh, no. So, for Ellis Stanlow, screwed. I was absolutely screwed up. And, um, the I other, can see why it would, but yeah. oh, my God, no. And the, my ligaments already weren't working, so I wasn't. my body wasn't able to hold these large babies. So, I was having early labor, like five months early oh labor. God. Yeah, so I was on, like, partial bed rest, and I had to have all of these extra drugs um, to develop the baby as quick as possible because it, it was like it was one of those ER episodes. Like <laughs> it ended well. Special well. Episode of ER. Yeah, it was, just, it was a special. You know, cue the tear jerking music. But these are all things that are like you know aspects of what happens with sex if you're trying to have babies or that there are different things that these disorders can affect. And if your doctor isn't saying, hey. Pregnancy with other stainless can be dangerous. Pregnancy with POTS can be, you know, these are things you need to watch out for. Yeah. Can be kind of a big deal. And the birth control, you know, my husband went to the vet and got fixed right after my daughter was born. <laughs> like, he was like, I cannot watch you go through that ever, ever again. And I believe my words to my OB, like, right before I had my daughter was, make this never happen to me again. Like, <laughs> she's like, oh, so if we, if we have to do a C-section, we'll just, like, tie everything up like oh god yes yes we're done two two done finished but that's also an issue is like hormonal birth control depending on what you have can really affect things like even for like things like the allergies and the ibs if you're female I had thought about that. Yeah, that stuff is, is pretty intense. I mean, we throw on birth control. It's like, oh, everyone just you know, take one. But there are some real-world side effects to it that can be fatal if you don't know exactly what you're doing. Yeah. 
I can see that. I did not know that stuff. You just ed- you just educate. Yeah, well, you know, as a, as a gay man, you don't have to deal with all of the the preventing pregnancy stuff. That is, yeah, the world of hormones. <laughs> there's other things you know you have to worry about still with that too. So that's true. Yeah, and that's you know other things with invisible illness that prep, people prep is see. a lifesaver. Yeah, and so do you want to explain what prep is? So yeah, I didn't know until you yeah. were chatting this. So uh, on the gay man male side of things. There is a dr- uh, drug called pre uh, called Truvada, which is the pre exposure prophylaxis, which basically it's sort of like um, a, it's a pill you take daily that um, is um, it's one of the first things they give for people who have um, HIV to try and suppress it. But if you take it daily, when you don't, it acts as a um, like taking the pill for stopping pregnancies it prevents it from taking hold in your body so it and I don't know all the, the medical rigmarole around how it works but basically it's a daily thing that makes it it makes it 99% that even if you are exposed you won't get it yeah which is crazy because you know I'm a little younger than you but I grew up when like HIV was Sheer terror. Not that it's not terrifying now, but it was like you were watching Friends go. Like, yeah. I mean, I grew up in the '80s, and it was '84 when it was um, first found. I was a freshman in high school. God. So uh, it's my entire adult life. That's been the re- the reality, and this you know this has been around for a couple of years now, and I only heard about it you know what a year and a half ago, and I'm you know fairly connected in I thought yeah but it's like oh yeah there's this thing out there and I'm like really and I had, you know I started actually looking into like how serious is this I'm like wow this is actually really a big deal and now it's like I, so I remember when it came out and um what I'm <laughs> I remember when the cocktail came out especially yeah. because one of my friends was almost dead and he was one of the the tests of the cocktail okay. so it went from i took him out to do photos of him for his mother so his mother would have pictures of him mm-hmm. as it looked like it was only going to be a little bit more time and that's when he was on the test for the cocktail and all of a sudden he went to almost no viral load and it was mm-hmm. that was just so baffling and it, it does feel almost like we went from like HIV of being this, like, you're going to die in a, a six months, a year, mm-hmm. to it's an invisible illness that yeah. is almost like a chronic illness that you're treating all the time. All right, so since we're already talking about the, um, <laughs> the not-so-funny and the deeply sad part, I'm going to talk about the things that I was really worried about talking about and a little nervous about, which is PTSD and sex, because I really believe that PTSD and emotional issues are invisible illness. They're yeah. definitely like, there's things that are on your mind and they're not visible. You don't see it. And I know that most people don't know my history of sexual assault and that that was a huge factor in my sex life and dating life for a long time. And I would actually have panic attacks being alone in a room with a man. Fun. Yeah. That makes dating <laughs> just a difficult. little difficult. I mean, it made dating women easier, but well, yeah. it did not make dating men easy at all. And it, it was actually incredibly impacting on my life because I was so young when those things started that I didn't have a really good grasp on how to be around other people even like it it was Mm -hmm. it was just so instrumental in like how I developed my own relationships that even in school if a teacher wanted me to stay after school I would have panic wow yeah and then you know the aspect of like being a teenage girl who had a big chest and a I I looked like an anime character when I was a teenager it was (laughs) it sounds adorable and it was just so traumatic like boys would snap my bra until my back blood and and boys were vile in high school and junior high and you know I had this reputation that at the time was not deserved (laughs) And that was that was a lot to deal with. So the idea of like building up a sexual relationship after rape, after sexual assault, becomes a really tricky thing that requires so much patience with the person moving forward with the relationship and the person who's entering into the relationship. Mm-hmm. Like my husband's probably the first person that I've dated that I haven't had to have these conversations with because I'm like twenty years past these things happening now and it just yeah. I thought it was going to be something that would affect my whole life and now it's like oh yeah that happened it's almost like a story like 
it doesn't affect things as much now. But back then, like, being touched was this very confusing thing of, I like this, but I'm really afraid where this is going to lead. At what point do I get to make this decision? Do I get to make this decision? It was weird. Uncomfortable, definitely. Very. Yeah, I... Thankfully, my experience in that particular realm was very different, so... I... I am also a sexual assault survivor, but mine was... My... I dealt with it okay. I didn't have the I'm afraid to be touched. Um... Probably be more because of the events that happened afterwards. I got hit with this massive amount of guilt and shame because the person who did it, their partner was in charge of the, this back in the days of the BBSs, was the person who ran the BBS that we all met through and launched into this campaign. You are going to have to explain to all the youngins what a okay. BBS is. A BBS, <laughs> back pre-internet, there was a, you'd call into a number and you'd have chat rooms and stuff like this for people to talk. Um, but it was something you actively connected to and it was like a local number and you'd call and you'd, you know, just... Like a chat room, my friends. <laughs> or like a chat room. And so the person who assaulted me, his partner was the person who ran this BBS. Yeah. And so by the time I even got home from when it happened, I had a nasty email for me saying, um, you know, that how dare I sleep with his partner and, it, you know, that I was just this horrible person. I'm like... He raped me. This was not my choice. This was, I was, they gave me drinks until I passed out because I was 21. I was stupid. I went to this party at this person's house and they were fixing me drinks outside the room where I was in. And then suddenly I got really, really tired, like real fast. And I passed on the bed and I woke up to being penetrated. This was not my choice. This was not my idea of a good time. And, but I think because of all the embarrassment over what happened and the fact that he immediately blamed me for it and so so enti- the entire group of people that they hung out with all blamed me. It was my fault. And I retreated from everything for probably six months, eight months and didn't hardly talk to anybody. I went to work and I... I didn't... Um, I don't think I kind of went in the typical way where it's like, don't touch me. When I finally came out of it, Mm -hmm. it was, for me, I needed to fill that space with positive things. And I kind of was a whore for a while. And just, like, okay, fine. I just need to have anything to blur that out so it goes away into the background. And I I know that most women probably wouldn't do that. I kind of went, like I said, to the opposite extreme that I did a lot in a very short period of time because I wanted something to, to, to blot that memory out. So how did it affect the next time you started dating? Did you... So the next time I started dating was a while after that. There's a, there's a long story around this, which I don't want to get too deep into. But the next time I actually started dating someone after that, it was several years later. Mm-hmm. So by then, again, I had, I had managed to do what I said, which was blot it out. Yeah. And I didn't think about it. I can't say I didn't think about it. I tried not to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> There's a difference. Yeah. I, I, if I'm honest, I tried not to think yeah. about it for a long time afterwards until, like you said, it faded far enough into the background that, okay, I can actually not think about this. Mm-hmm. But the way it did change me because of the drinking, I didn't hardly drink for the next 15 years after that. Yeah. Um, it's only really been in the, like the last 10 when I've been with David that I've actually started drinking again because I just didn't... The taste of alcohol brought all those memories back. Oh, God, I can imagine. And, you know, I... In the intervening time, I got drunk once, and that was... Twice, sorry, twice. Both times was when I was going through a breakup, and I was with people that I trusted. Yeah. And I got... I never got drunk enough, you know, like that again, that where I wasn't in complete control of the situation. And that's why I have such a hard limit now of I don't get drunk enough that I'm losing control. And so there's another aspect, and we're going to also move into... The, Some of the solutions we can... The solutions, but also we're going to move into like how um, medical tests and the, the pain from like touch in a medical can also affect... But, and I think this also goes to both of those things, because being in your body is an important part of sex. Mm-hmm. And when your body is betraying you or is betrayed, it's really hard to stay present 
and mm-hmm. to um, to be there. So segueing into also the the medical tests that you have to go through, and if you're hospitalized, and we were just we, before we started recording, we were both talking about our spinal stuff we had done, <sighs> and like for me being touched on my back, it creeps me out. It almost makes me sick because I had had a spinal puncture go wrong. Yeah, <laughs> you cannot do expressions. I'm you cringing. cannot cringe on a podcast. I was cringing, but I was going to say that I was cringing. <laughs> So that's also something to think about as well. Like my dad had been in a horrible car accident in his twenties and he had told me about how it was like it just even kind hugs and things were were like, okay, someone's touching me, that means a needle, that means another test. And I you know, I'm right there with that. Like just even like not aside from sex, like the inside of my arms, I hate them being touched because that's where I get all my, my blood draws and Yeah. For me it's my feet. Yeah. It's my feet that, like, I was, you no, know, it really came to my mind this morning because I put my slippers on and my toes just brushed across the material of my slipper before I did. And oh, yeah. it just shot sh- shooting pain up my leg. Yeah. Neuropathy is another thing that, like, yep. you know, you're just, like, in bed and your feet go against the covers and you're like, ah, you <laughs> jump <know>. out. <laughs> and I've had time where the guys are like, oh, you know, you see your feet here, let me rub your feet. And they soon as they touch my feet, I'm practically glued yep. to the ceiling. <laughs> Cat so, in a bath. <laughs> No, 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 don't touch. I have to be really in the right place for you to touch my feet because they hurt so bad that if I'm not prepared for it, it will just, if I'm not prepared to like, okay, consciously block, don't yeah. feel this, don't feel this, don't feel this. If something just like, oh, here, let me grab your foot and help. Like, no, God, no, ow, stop, 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 ow. So that's like another being present thing is when <laughs> half of your brain is like, I'm not showing how much pain I'm in. I'm oh, only God, showing yes. you how much I'm enjoying this sexual activity. Like that's quite the divide there. Yep. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. How, how often have I been, you know, in the process of doing something and all of a sudden, like, oh, I'm hurting, oh, I'm hurting, oh, I'm hurting, please don't show it, please don't show it, I don't want to make this bad for this other person. Yeah. I'm not going to show that I'm hurting. No, 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 don't, don't. That whimper was just me being happy, really. <laughs> <laughs> now that was, that was supposed to come out differently. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like I've had to tell my husband, like unless I, because when I dislocate, there's a loud popping sound. So I just told, like, look, unless I say stop, <laughs> I'm just going to ignore that for right now. Like, just continue as usual. <laughs> I'm going to start calling you Pop Goes the Weasel. Oh no, you are not. <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely no. <laughs> hey, I can, I can, I can qualify that with my knee now. <laughs> That's true. You haven't, and we've um, we've definitely talked about the medical marijuana for yeah. for these things and bringing it back to sex. <laughs> it's actually like what you can use before, not for anything like that. Stop no, no, that no, expression. No, no. no I'll t- I have something I want to say. When you <laughs> I, I... But it's almost like a warm up. You put the like the medical marijuana on joints that will hurt. And then they move better because we were going to segue over into different things that can help. And that's like one of the big things that helps is the medical marijuana for joint pain. Mm -hmm. The the thing that I was going to say, the reason I covered my mouth, it was one of my friends just posted on Facebook yesterday that he's in a trial now to uh, test marijuana based lube. I've heard about that. (laughs) And, and, you know, of course, all the people. But why for men? No, I, I understand. No, I get that. It, you got to stop doing expressions on the podcast. No, I, so Whoopi Goldberg has her own um, company of medical marijuana. Okay. And I, I probably don't understand enough about gay sex to understand why you're <laughs> laughing at me, and that's totally funny. You can go ahead and laugh at me. But the reason she did it is because um, there's the lube is supposed to relax the muscles inside. And uh-huh. for women, oh, now I get it. Thank you. <laughs> That's, that's why I give you the look of, are you kidding? <laughs> I'm really <laughs> slow today. Everyone just has to forgive me. I have like five dislocations right now. But, but yeah, he, he posted this and I'm, my, my first thought was, why would you? Oh. <laughs> okay, so you're saying you didn't get it first either. You were just smarter than I was and quicker on the uptake. Fine, yes. I'll give that to you. Because <laughs> um, at first I thought he was kidding about it. I thought it was like a joke. And then it's like. Why would you? Oh, okay. But for medical issues. Yeah, for real. <laughs> for, there's like a vaginitis where like the, the canal can actually like seize up 
so tight and painfully that there's no entering. There's no anything. So that's like part of what the, yeah, you're, you, I wish you guys could see the way he does facial expressions. They are <laughs> fucking hilarious. And someday I'm going to record this on video just so you can be as entertained as I am. We can do a video podcast of this. That's fine. No, because I'll have to brush my hair. <laughs> But but yeah, I was I was just nodding along, going uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. uh-huh. yeah. No, but it, it's not his nodding. It's that he does his eyebrow raises, his face turns beet red, and he has these cheeks that just go all the way up. It's <laughs> hilarious. Um, no, so like medical marijuana, I guess for both sides, totally works. <laughs> We, we really got into the weeds on that one. Oh. And yeah, we, we are. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh. So the medical Hot marijuana is... Black there. Mm, <laughs> that's definitely one of the things I recommend. And there's also the body pillows and the wedge pillows mm-hmm. for different positions and also just to keep limbs in check. <laughs> keep everything where it's supposed to be? Yeah, that. Or where you want it to be? Where you want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> um... We, we mentioned it before is like you know talk 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 so as someone who's in a poly relationship you know you're going to talk you talk to your blue in the face and then you talk a little bit more when you have an invisible endless it's kind of the same thing that you don't get to just fool around you always have to be talking about oh hey um i can't do this because of this i can't do this because of this um i know it'd be really hot if we could you know do this standing up but my feet will not allow me to do this standing up <laughs> As the person in the boring, vanilla, heteronormative, like, the Republicans would actually approve of my relationship. Yeah. See, you guys see his expressions. They're <laughs> so cute. That was a dirty look. From that was a dirty the, look. <laughs> I, believe statement. me, I never expected that I would be remotely Republican approved, but somehow that's just how the cards shuffled. But in any relationship, it is the talking, like, the ad nauseum talking all the time. But it really is communication. And going back to, like, what we had talked about when we first started this podcast, it was that just being able to discuss the expectations and have a game plan for what happens if things go off the rails, but it really comes down to trust and like trusting your partner enough to, to know that they're going to get it and they're not going to walk. And like, I was, yeah. And my new favorite magazine, (laughs) which you're going to laugh at me is teen Vogue. Well, which okay. the leader of the resistance and yes. I never thought I'd love them, but I do. And they have a sex column or a relationship column. Okay. And it was so applicable to what we're talking about right now. It was a girl who was saying that she really enjoyed like playing with this one boy. She's really enjoying like all of the like different stages of sexuality that they were exploring, but she wasn't ready to go any further. And the advice was so beautiful and it was so perfect about how wonderful that you're enjoying this, how great that you discover your sexuality. That's fantastic. And there's no shame to it, but make sure that the person you're with is someone that you're close enough to, and you feel safe enough to be able to have a conversation. But if you can't have that conversation, and this is like the advice I give my kids, you know, whether they like me talking to them or not, <laughs> the main advice I give is to even anyone is if you don't feel safe, it's not about like making sure you have like the approved relationship or yeah. the commitment. The issue is, is do you trust this person? Do you feel safe enough to have a conversation? Because if you don't feel safe enough to have the conversation, that's probably not the best situation for you to be in. And the advice ended up being, you know, like if you don't have that, find someone that you can play with and enjoy your sexuality with that you do trust. Yeah. Um, kind of in the other vein of solutions yeah. is medication. But I don't, I don't know how it is for a woman, but I know as a man, when I take Vicodin for my pain, it dulls all of my nerve endings. Oh, God. Which means, you know, if I take a Vicodin for my foot pain, it may mean that, you know, this feels good, but it's never, ever going to go. <laughs> it's not going to happen. You know, if, if you're working for a, a goal, a goal is not going to happen. The, the, my nerve endings are all dulled down right now. Oh, my God. See, I ha- I did not realize that that happened until it happened. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, oh, never. Uh, relax, honey. I'm so sorry. And this has nothing to do with you. But, but, but we're not getting any. Yeah, no, this. chill. We, we, we can watch RuPaul tonight. <laughs> Don't worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> because I have to take the Vicodin and I have to take the muscle relaxers. Yeah. So I become Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> 
and ignored the beauty part. <laughs> like, I become You're very sleep- attractive. Don't even play that game. <laughs> I become sleeping in sweatpants, woman. <laughs> like, <laughs> poor, poor man. I swear. I think he's actually going to be okay after he hears this. We did not cover any of that. Yeah, I don't think either of us are going to need marital therapy or a lawyer. <laughs> so I think we're okay. <laughs> But I think the the last two things that we we had that we wanted to kind of cover with this with the salute possible solutions um, we've kind of already touched on, which is the being honest and upfront about your limitations, and you know adapt, find ways to make things work. You know if you know the, you're taking the drugs and you can't actually achieve orgasm like you'd like to, you know the other person's not taking medication. Make sure they enjoy themselves, yeah. and that's fine, and be okay with that. The the place you have to be careful. I think with that is, you know, if you're taking medication on a regular basis, like, okay, when's it my turn? <laughs> <laughs> I've never had that problem. I'm not, I'm not, uh, not, honey, saying. I'm not saying that. I'm just <laughs> but for saying others that, out there. Yes. I'm saying that, you know, this is a thing that, you know, make sure that if you are listening to this and you are the caretaker of a person that you remember that, yeah, even if they're on medication and something's going on where they can't try to make sure they get there occasionally. Yeah, maybe like um, just not always having such goal-oriented sex. And that's, yes, like, very much. So I was reading a really cool article and I loved it and we'll Wait, never remember which... Wait, non-goal-oriented sex? What the hell? Oh, please. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> there was a really cool article of this woman who had an invisible illness and she and her husband had used to have like acrobatic sex, like break the bed sex and then she ended up with an invisible illness I can't remember which one it was but suddenly she was just in agony doing anything it was really fucking with their relationship (laughs) 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 Um, I use the word fuck like a comma so (laughs) it'll be unintentional puns so cute Um, but she said that she and her husband actually got to a place where they decided that they decided what was sex that they weren't going to let that be defined by someone else. So when things were really bad, just getting naked and being close was sex for them. And I thought that was like, that was so cool to like take that away because it becomes a pressure yeah. and it becomes like this big red button issue if you let it. Yeah, it can. Definitely. I can see that. Yeah. So I think that we've come to the end of this. Yeah. I, I think we've both made ourselves deeply uncomfortable <laughs> oh, and like trying to like, walk the line between like, Emma, is my mother going to speak to me after this? Is my husband going to speak to me after this? I think we did well. I think we did pretty good at navigating uncomfortable areas while still being hopefully informative and educational. I say we both get pats on the back and in a non-sexual way, pat on the back. <laughs> But if you feel like we didn't cover something or there's something you feel like we wish we had talked about, we have a Facebook page you can comment on. Um, feel free to tweet at us. We're Invisible Not Broken on Twitter. Uh, we would be happy to hear from you if we don't get back to you. Remember, we are both very sick, and sometimes we <laughs> <laughs> it takes a lot just to drag us to our computers, but we will we will try to get back to you. If and you are offended, we're not sorry. Um If you are offended, please go do your own thing that you love and think is brilliant and let us do our thing and be offensive. Yeah. And, you know, if you do think of something that you wish we talked about, definitely leave it in a comment on Facebook or or send us something on Twitter because, you know, then we might be able to revisit it or bring it up in a different one of our podcasts. Yeah. And we have panels every month. So if there's a topic you're dying for us to chat about or completely obliterate, (laughs) let us know. And uh, so I think that's it for this yeah. time. So share us, subscribe to us. We we love the love. Send nice, loving reviews. And, and until be, next week. Be kind. Be gentle. And be a badass. And be a fucking badass. Thank you so much for listening to Invisible Not Broken this week. We will return to our interviews next week. I also wanted to send a thank you out to Vetha. I hope I'm pronouncing that right for your review. Listening to this podcast reminds me we are not alone. Also, I adore the snark. Thank you for totally understanding us, Vetha. We, that's what we're doing is trying to show everyone that they're not alone and for people to become educated on what invisible illness is like, all with a heavy, heavy dose of snark. Thank you again for listening. Please be sure to press subscribe, share us with a friend, and until next week, be kind, be gentle, and be a badass.